Uh, welcome, uh, for me that is. You're all here already. Uh, it's a great honour to be here and to follow my speech, uh, have my speech follow all these wonderful speakers earlier and uh, perhaps, perhaps even be heard. How am I doing back there? Is this audible at this point? Very good. <laughs> uh, I left it to the earlier speakers to give coherent, rounded presentations of the reason we're here. I'm going to uh, be incoherent and pointed and just mention a couple of little stories and uh, perhaps draw a couple of threads before I get dragged off. Uh, sometime late last year, I went out to dinner with someone I've known for about 40 years. We met in Western Australia, that's a key. <laughs> and uh, I haven't met him for a long time and we were having a lovely dinner. And he said something like this, you uh, work in uh, medical research, don't you? I said, yes. He said, do you know much about cancer? I said, well, a little bit. I collaborate with people working on cancer. Then he said, have you ever heard of Royal Rife? And I looked blank. And, you know, I don't expect that I know all about cancer. How many people here know who Royal Rife is? I don't expect to look here, see a lot of... Okay, well, here's the thing. Sometime in the 1930s, this American named Royal Rife found a cure for cancer. All cancers. And it's been suppressed ever since by the cancer industry, by the researchers, by the drug companies, by governments. All these people that pour money into cancer are doing it for their own selfish reasons because the cure lay right back there. Well, I'm, you know, we're sitting in a restaurant and my heart sank. And I said, well, do you really think that's possible? You know, I know a few cancer researchers. They're very keen to cure cancer. And uh, they're driven people, particularly the women. That's a small joke, you're supposed to smile. Anyway, these are people who I cannot believe would go along with a conspiracy. He said, well, you just look it up, look it up. And I went back, of course, that night and looked it up. And sure enough, there was a person called Royal Rife, and he did cure cancer back in the 1930s. And, uh, well, it has not been found to be effective. Now, we cut to the 1970s, when I'm in Western Australia. There was... Okay. There was a Premier who thought that he would go above his scientific advisors and purchased for the state of Western Australia a machine called the Trinata machine. Some people from Western Australia will recognise this. And this was an implementation of this brilliant cure back in the 1930s. And it was a West Australian first. And it didn't work. It actually harmed some people, as Fiona points out. Now we'll move on a little bit. 1974. Let's go to 2004. We have a young, active, dynamic Minister for Health and Ageing, who I will not name. And he asked the National Health and Medical Research Council, would they review the evidence that this radiation cures cancer? Would they look into the work that had been done over the previous 40 years in Western Australia and had been known worldwide to be ineffective at curing cancer? And the NHMRC, as they are called, went off and wrote a very long report, a year's work, finding it had no effect whatsoever. <coughs> there were no clinical cases of effectiveness. There were no published results that demonstrate effectiveness. Now we'll move on a little bit to 2014. That's just 10 years later. That same Minister of Health is now Prime Minister. And a hot topic is global warming. And you may not believe this, unless perhaps you watched Q&A when there was a certain new senator and uh, Brian Cox, a uh, luminary from the UK. There is a group within Australia, there may be more than a handful, probably not more than two handfuls, but they are very noisy, very vociferous, they don't even believe that global warming has occurred, much less that it might or might not be caused by human activities. They think 
that the rise in temperature that we hear so much about is a fabrication and that parties to that fabrication are our own Bureau of Meteorology and NASA and the meteorology people in the UK, the Met Office and all the worldwide meteorologists have conspired to show global warming is occurring when it's not. And this Prime Minister got his minister to get his parliamentary secretary to set up a committee to examine the statistics of the data demonstrating that global warming, at least Australian temperatures are rising. One of the really discons... I'll wait till the fire is put out. That particular fire, we have many others. <laughs> uh, as a statistician, I was invited to be on that committee and I said I have no previous experience with statistics and climate. And of course the answer was that is exactly why we want to. Anybody who has any previous experience will have a vested interest in the outcome. They will bring knowledge, they will bring understanding, they will bring their biases, they're corrupt as we know, the CSIRO, NASA, all these other groups are corrupt. We need outside people to expose the fallacy of global warming. And so we've had our committee meetings and would you believe we did not find that the Bureau of Meteorology made up the data. We found that they have treated the data reasonably satisfactorily. Uh, we have another committee meeting in about two weeks, though I seriously expect I might be disinvited to it if reports of these remarks reach the appropriate minister. So I just want to draw a couple of little conclusions there. Here we have a tiny number of people outside the scientific mainstream. And uh, if you watch the Q&A, you'll see that the idea of scientific consensus is anathema to these individuals who are right out there in outer space. They think scientific consensus is unscientific. And I hope we here understand that that is not the case. That is not inconsistent with being sceptical. That is not inconsistent with knowing that we have more to learn and that our understanding is incomplete. It's not inconsistent with any of the scientific method to have a consensus. <laughs> but the other side, and I'll think of our new senator as a representative of it, they try to turn the tables on us. They try to say consensus is anti-scientific. The idea of experts, people who know something, that's already a bad thing. Organisations like CSIRO, of course they're corrupt. And these are not words I'm using. These are words you see in the writings of these people. <laughs> so, coming back to the themes of our meeting here today. What are we going to do to make sure that people don't buy conspiracy theories about science? And the point that I want to make before I sit down is it usually is not simple. Malcolm Roberts wanted Brian Cox to show him the evidence of human cause of global warming. He didn't want any equations or any models. He just wanted something on a piece of paper that nailed it. And we know it isn't that simple. Any more than showing that a particular bogus cure for cancer is bogus. You need to do some work to prove that it's effective. <coughs> so. Things are not simple. We're going to be working on the educational side of science and we're going to make it clear that it will not be reduced to one page, one slogan, one simple idea. And I just want to finish with a quote that I would like to dissociate myself from totally. It may or may not be true because I read it on the web. In fact, I read it on Malcolm Roberts' website. Out of intense complexity, intense simplicity emerges. I couldn't disagree more. That is attributed to Winston Churchill. Almost certainly he didn't say it, but if he did, he was wrong, wrong and wrong. Thank you.
To every complex problem there is a simple solution and it is always wrong. I think that's the message. And what fantastic examples of sheer wasted money and lives from those examples that Terry gave.